Hey guys, what's up? It's Biscuit Boo Horror Reviews, and I'm back with some classic, fucking classic Biscuit Boo Horror Review content. I'm, of course, talking about videos about extreme and disturbing cinema. I haven't done one of these kinds of videos in quite a while. It's been like two years. I used to do an update video every summer uh, on my, like, you know, what I would consider to be the 20 most disturbing movies ever made, and I've kind of, you know, grown out of that niche a little bit. Um... Not to say that that niche is inherently uh, immature or, you know, not interesting. Uh, it's just that I've kind of run out of movies to, to, to kind of, you know, grow the list with or, you know, change stuff around. I think the list is pretty solid the way it is. However, I have this year, despite my mental health not being very good this year... Uh, been absolutely just destroying myself mentally with all kinds of weird, fucky, horrible, bad for your brain type extreme cinema. So, I figured I'd do a classic like, hey, here's ten or so movies. Uh, I usually used to do like the five movies, five disturbing movies you overlooked. This one's gonna be ten. Um, and yeah, here's here's ten movies, random order, that you know I've 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 most of these I've watched this year, um, actually all of these I've I watched this year, uh, and these are all titles I've I've discovered this year, and I've thought to myself, yeah, that's actually kind of kind of a depressing, disturbing, uh, not fun movie. Um, so these are just random titles. You know, I would argue that not all of these are super well-known or talked about among the disturbing movie crowd. Ten movies, random order, random varying levels of uh, discomfort and, um, you know, depression and uh, just all-around agony that you will experience watching these. So let's just dive right into this shit. Up first, we have the most lighthearted and easiest to handle of the bunch, and this is actually not a movie I would recommend to necessarily people who are looking for a disturbing movie. However, I would recommend this to just about everybody in general. I'm talking about Godzilla vs. Hedorah. Um, kind of weird to see a Godzilla film, especially a Showa-era Godzilla film, on a list of disturbing movies. Um, because the Showa-era films were mostly, you know, pretty lighthearted. Uh, especially after the first one, um, especially after the original Godzilla, like, you know, the rest of the series is pretty much just fucking camp and cheese. However, Godzilla vs. Hedorah, also known as Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, is not fun at all. Um, essentially, what you get with, uh, Godzilla vs. Hedorah is... This creature spawned from the pollution of Earth, and it's a giant, horrible blob monster that emits a toxic smog that kills literally everything within a mile radius of it. Um, and the thing that makes this Godzilla film particularly disturbing is it's got this weird mix of like animated segments, surreal, trippy, like psychedelic um, visuals. There's uh, quite a lot of death in this film, you know? Like, when you think about Godzilla films, you don't think... You often don't think about the victims, the the, the human lives that are obviously going to be lost in these giant, goofy rubber suit monsters destroying a city. However, in this film, you legitimately see, like, hundreds of people die on screen due to Hidora's presence, and that's kind of really horrifying to see. Um, the toxic smog that he emits literally causes somebody to, like, just disintegrate into nothing but bones on screen. And again, this isn't necessarily, like, a super disturbing title, but it's a really interesting film, and it's the only Godzilla film other than, like, um, Shin Godzilla and the original 54 Godzilla, where I've watched it and I've thought to myself, man, the plot to this is actually good. Like, it, it's actually interesting. It doesn't feel like an excuse, uh, a really poorly written excuse to just show monsters fighting. So, yeah, I, I really just want to say, like, Godzilla vs. Sidora, probably one of the best Godzilla films, in my opinion. Um, 
and uh, I highly recommend it in general to just about anybody. But especially if if you think like, man, you know, all these Godzilla movies are kind of goofy, kind of the same. Godzilla vs. Hedorah really takes it somewhere. Uh, up next is The Cremator from 1969. This is a Czechoslovakian dark comedy horror drama film. Uh, essentially about a guy who runs a crematorium. And he believes that through cremating corpses you can absolve all sins from the person's life. Uh, it's kind of an interesting, surreal, slow-paced little uh, art film, I guess. It's supposed to be a dark comedy. I didn't catch any of the humor in it. But I do catch the notes of disturbing, bleak, kind of depressing uh, moments in the film. Uh, it's, it's, it's just kind of not a... Really, really fun time to watch, but I do kind of. I do. This is another one that I kind of would just recommend in general, um, because this is like actually a pretty cool little movie. Uh, it's owned by Criterion. It's distributed by Criterion in the U.S. And I think it's very much worth uh, seeking out and checking out, because uh, I'd never really heard of this film until Criterion was like, "Yeah, we got this." Czechoslovakian new wave art film that hasn't had a Blu-ray release in the U.S. Um, and we're doing it up and, and, and I was like huh that sounds interesting and I watched it and I was like yeah that's it's definitely something um y yeah uh also the the, the 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 portrayal of the main character the acting from the lead actor is absolutely amazing the dude is super unhinged super uncomfortable and creepy I, I really, really like The Cremator. It's a movie that took me, you know, a, a lot of time to really start to appreciate. But it's 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 a, it's a pretty cool little movie, especially for, you know, late 60s Czechoslovakia. Uh, up next is The Joy of Torture from 1968. Uh, I've heard people in the disturbing film scene talk about the sequel to this film, Shogun's Sadism, a.k.a. Um, Joy of Torture 2, Split Oxen Torture, uh, which, don't get me wrong, like, that movie is definitely pretty fucking disturbing in its own way, but it, that one feels a bit more like a splatter film, you know, people are getting limbs ripped off and stuff. The Joy of Torture, though, uh, the first one, is an anthology, I think it's only like two different segments, but it's, it's literally just an excuse to show kind of pseudo, kind of pornographic BDSM type bondage, and, and combined with a lot of whipping, burning, executions, uh, it's not a fun time. It's, it's very, very visceral and gritty and just not, not fun. It's, I would compare the torture in The Joy of Torture to, um, like the torture scenes and uh, Pascal Langier's Martyrs, because Martyrs is is a film that like I don't think is necessarily gory. I think it's it's got it's got quite a bit of blood to it. Um, it's very visceral. It's very real. The torture doesn't feel like you know you're just bringing power tools into the situation and drilling into somebody's kneecap. It it, it it's it's literal just human suffering at its core. And that's kind of what I think Joy of Torture has going on with its uh, scenes of, of torture and degradation. Um, I will say the movie as, as an actual film isn't like anything amazing, but I found it to be extremely captivating and uncomfortable. And uh, if those are your things, that's something I would recommend. I'd also recommend the director of that film. He also did a film um, in the late 60s, as well, I think it was like late 60s, early 70s, called The Horrors of Malformed Men, which is... Uh, kind of a Japanese Island of Dr. Moreau type situation, but that one is is also pretty relatively disturbing. It's got some got some pretty gross moments and uh, got a really great surreal atmosphere to it. Honestly, the guy who's responsible for for this movie, crazy director. Honestly, this movie and like Jigoku are like two of the wildest Japanese horror films to come out before the 70s because you know you have a lot of Japanese weird Japanese horror films and exploitation titles coming out in the 70s like Blind Woman's Curse and uh, 
Blind Woman's Curse, the Stray Cat Rock films, uh, Female Prisoner Scorpion, you know, uh, Haosu, uh, of course, how can I, how can I not mention Haosu, uh, so to see something, you know, that's this, this just, wow, uh, this early in the, uh, era of filmmaking in, in Japan is, is actually pretty impressive, um, I also just want to give a solid recommendation to Jigoku, because that film, especially the latter half, is like really, really out there. Uh, up next we have a like video, audio collage type found footage silent film uh, called The Manson Family Movies. This is a film that was made based on the urban legend that the Manson family stole cameras from news trucks and filmed the murders they committed. Uh, this is a film I've been wanting to see for a very long time. Um, you know, mainly because, like, I I've always heard that it's kind of an interesting, disturbing little film. And, I mean, considering it's being featured in this video, it's definitely disturbing. And I'm pretty sure even, the la even in the last uh, video of this type that I did, of recommending random disturbing movies, I mentioned Jim Van Bever's The Manson Family. This is a very good companion piece. Um, this one is pretty much a completely a, a silent film. The only audio you have is music that is be, that is written and performed by uh, Charles Manson and the Manson family. And it's, you know, there's like weird sections of the film where there's inner titles kind of included to give you some kind of context as to what's being said between characters and these inner titles are like written on the walls in blood or written on paper with marker um it's kind of a surreal experience uh you know and the thing is the film feels very legitimate and very real uh up until the violence comes on to screen because when you get to the scenes that are literally the Manson murders the actress they have playing Sharon Tate doesn't look anything like Sharon Tate and again there are crazy inner titles written on the walls in blood in between scenes which just kind of feels like while I do think those scenes are still kind of disturbing um it feels a little too over the top for the tone that the film was going for because Really, it's just a it's just a straight up like straight vibin' kind of chill experience with it just being for the first like forty thirty to forty minutes I think, just the Manson family um, just kind of hanging out, doing drugs, fucking, and it's just got this this you know music set over it that's that's relatively uh, nice sounding. So, yeah, it's it's a weird audiovisual collage, definitely far, not what I was expecting at all. I was expecting, like, a straight-up kind of August Underground, um, maybe the Home Invasion segment of Henry, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer type of, you know, found footage, shot on video, kind of, not shot on video, but, you know, kind of found footage-y uh, kind of thing. I was expecting this to be just straight up, like, a very early... Uh, found footage film and that's kind of what it is but it's but the way it's presented is extremely unique and I have to recommend it simply on that um, basis alone uh, up next we have an extremely artful and beautiful film that I saw this year uh, completely randomly I'd never heard of it and then I heard about it in passing I looked into it I watched it and I was like this is this might be one of my new favorite movies I'm of course talking about the cook the thief his wife and her lover um, this is a film from like the late 80s that is essentially a it, it takes place pretty much entirely in one location which is this restaurant and the set for the restaurant is like very surreal, very bright, vibrant, beautifully, kind of colorfully lit. Um, the exterior for the restaurant is like, it, it feels like another dimension, and it kind of has a Suspiria-like feeling with its uh, otherworldly, you know, nature. But the, but the cook, the thief, his wife, and her lover uh, is essentially about a gangster, that being the thief, who forces, who is like blackmailing a cook who owns a restaurant um, into making food for him and his, you know, goons and his wife, his wife, every single night. And his wife starts to have an affair with another man who's a regular at the restaurant who um, basically just sits there all night reading books. And they start to have an affair 
uh, behind the back of the thief character, the, mo the mobster. And this kind of goes places and it doesn't end very well. Uh, I would give more details, but like, this film is extremely bare bones, but despite that, it's also very, very beautifully shot and I really love it. Um, the acting is really great. It's a great dark comedy. It's got some really, like, I think heavy horror elements to it, but it's not, I wouldn't classify it as a horror film. Um, it's definitely more of kind of like a night, it's, it's got a kind of nightmare drama comedy kind of thing going on, very similar to some of Yorgos Lanthimos' films. Um, in fact, this film is what inspired, uh, Ari Aster to make, um, Hereditary, because he believed that, like, this film, if you stripped away all of the beauty in the film, it's nothing but degradation and hatred and madness and discom discomfort, um, which is what he was trying, kind of trying to do with, with Hereditary, is make a film that's entirely miserable and unpleasant, but very well made and beautifully made, um, very well made, very beautifully shot, very nice looking. And uh, I can I can respect that. Uh, next, we have a documentary titled "A Certain Kind of Death." This documentary is not a fun watch. I stayed up until like 5 a.m. in order to finish it. I put it on in the background, and then I was like, "Wait a minute! I actually wanted to see this documentary, so I actually rewinded it and like you know sat down and paid attention to it." And by the time I had started watching it, it was like four in the morning by the time I finished watching it it was about five and I was extremely tired and uh, I woke up the next day absolutely despising my existence for putting myself through this which is kind of why I recommend this documentary a certain kind of death is essentially um, a documentary about what happens to people who die and they have no next of kin to claim their body they have nobody to pay for their funeral um, they are basically at that point just them and their property are basically just numbers on a screen. They are property of the state. And more often, and it's basically just about what happens to these people, which is really, really tragic and horrible. And it's crazy to see people who work in this field, you know, cataloging these things. Because in the documentary, you know, you have them being interviewed and they're on the phone talking about, you know, how how they've been trying to find this particular person's family and somebody comes in the room and is like hey we're uh we're, we're ordering quiznos for lunch what do you want and she and the, you know they're like uh uh get me this like it's it's just like it's so casual it's really really horrible um the one big problem i have with this uh documentary is the fact that it shows a lot of corpses in the morgue um uh, presumably these are corpses of people who probably have no family um, and that just feels really really exploitive and you know needless especially when you take into consideration that this is supposed to be a film about you know respecting the dead and about you know how if you don't have anybody in your life uh, you will end up just as property of the state when you die you know, and it's it's kind of weird that a documentary that's saying that would then show extensive scenes of corpses um, without the consent of the family or anybody else. Up next is Joshua from 2007. Joshua is a film that I'd been meaning to see for a very long time, ever since I had first heard about it when I was in high school. And uh, I watched it, and this is like one of the best creepy kids, kind of evil children type movies I've ever seen. And, you know, that genre, that subgenre, is very rife with, you know, movies that are not very good at all. You know, like Children of the Corn, as much as I personally really like that movie, it's not a good movie at all. Um, you have movies like The Children, the movie about radioactive zombie children that kill people by hugging them um it's 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 not a genre that you can pull off very well however when you can pull it off and do it you know in a really like great creepy manner it's a major win i think one of the best 
examples of this is probably Who Can Kill a Child, which is a uh, Spanish horror film from the 70s. It's super creepy, super uncomfortable, um, just really, really out there. Um, but simultaneously, and it's, it's kind of exploitive too, but simultaneously it's, it's kind of restrained, it's very just not fun, unpleasant, creepy, those kinds of adjectives. The film I'm talking about is Joshua, um, if I haven't said it already, Joshua being a film from 2007, essentially about a young boy who starts to show sociopathic tendencies, uh, after his, uh, sister, after his younger sister is born, um, and, you know, he starts to kind of mess with his own family, mess with his parents, mess with the baby, um, there's a lot of crazy shit that happens along the way, um, there's some really, really great acting, and the fucking, oh god, <sighs> And the kid who plays Joshua, like, really hasn't done much since then, which is kind of a shame, because he's really great in the film. As far as I know, Joshua doesn't have, like, a U.S. Blu-ray release, which is a shame, because this movie came out in, like, 2007, you know, small, limited release, nobody saw it, nobody really cared, it's got, like, a 5.8 out of 10 on IMDb currently, which I think is... A real shame because this film definitely I think deserves at least a at least a six and a half. Like I honestly think that this movie is like an eight out of ten. Like really really high up there. Really great, uh, creepy, uncomfortable film. And I know I'm saying the same adjectives over and over again, but um, I'm I'm not the the brightest uh, bulb in the bunch. Uh, fuck. Either way, Joshua really really cool stuff um definitely one of the best kind of creepy killer kids type movies and uh yeah that's all i have to say about that next we got another czechoslovakian film this one being witch hammer from 1970 um this is a film basically about the witch trials that occurred in the dark ages um and, you know, for those of you who don't know about the, the witch trials, um, something that I read, which I thought was really, really wild, is that during these kind of witch trial crusades, um, I can't think of the fucking word, uh, during these, dur during, basically during this inquisition that, uh, occurred, there is an estimated, like, half a million women, innocent women, who were burned at the stake for being witches, and that's just burned at the stake. That doesn't include hangings, that doesn't include being drowned, that doesn't include dying due to being tortured. Uh, and Witch Hammer is basically just a film about that. It is a um, black and white kind of art film uh, about this Inquisition and women being tortured, and I'm pretty sure one of the like lead kind of inquisitioners is even, uh, starts to realize, like, hey, maybe this isn't a bad, good thing, and, you know, he's eventually put on trial. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like Ken Russell's The Devils, which is a really great movie, um, except it's not as good as The Devils, in my opinion. Uh, The Devils, I think, has a lot more going on, it's a lot more visually interesting, but Witch Hammer is still really, really great, well acted, super, super, just fucked up, um, a little film about witch trials, um, also the cinematography in the film is just so, so beautiful, I, I highly recommend, uh, Witch Hammer, just kind of, almost in general, like, some of the torture scenes are, are a tad bit disturbing on the, on the more gratuitous side, but for the most part, it's, like, about, on par with like maybe Witchfinder General, maybe not Witchfinder General actually. Maybe it's more on par with something like Haxon, for example. I would probably, I'd, yeah, I'd probably say it's like about as disturbing as Haxon, and uh, I'd recommend it just as much as I would Haxon or Witchfinder General or The Witch, um, especially if you love like folk horror, kind of witch-based horror. It's it's this this is definitely one to seek out. Alright, okay, we're on to the last two. 
these are uh, this 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 the the, the this one um, yeah okay so up next we have pig chicken suicide from 1981 this is a, a Japanese art film from the early 80s, uh, essentially that is supposed to be about, um, you know, xenophobia within the country uh, against any kind of foreigners, and it's uh, about a Korean couple whose relationship is pretty much destroyed by said xenophobia. Um, the big thing is, is that like there's not much of a of plot, at least in the first hour of this film. Uh, it's mainly just kind of a weird audio-visual collage, and uh, yeah, that's kind of all I really want to say. I should also mention that there's a very long, like, almost three-minute, I want to say probably three-minute long scene of pigs being slaughtered, and it is, like, one of the most nauseating things I have ever seen in my entire life, and I hate myself for putting myself through that, because... There, there are elements of this film that I really, really like, and I kind of want to say I like this movie as, as a very strange, disturbing, um, kind of art house, kind of transgressive art film, I should say. You know, as a, as a, as, as somebody who appreciates transgression, um, in art, I can appreciate aspects of this film. Uh, however, the, 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 the animal cruelty is, like, really, really hard to overlook, and that's kind of a no for me but there's other things about this film that are that are, I think are um, worth appreciating particularly there's a scene that I really like that is basically the Korean one like, one like the main character walking down the street and a meat merchant who's like selling pork um, is literally standing there like starts yelling at this guy who isn't paying him any mind about how fresh this pork is. He's holding up handfuls of the pork. And he, as the Korean guys are like walking down this alley. The meat merchant is walking around him. As he is fucking moving. The camera is over the shoulder of the meat merchant. And it's very it's a very disorienting scene. Um, and you add into the fact that on top of this guy screaming about like fresh meat. There's also just babies crying thrown over top of it. Which is like super just unset upsetting like the scene in general oh god like that scene in general is, is kind of very upsetting and not um fun but it's also really really wild and interesting and i kind of love it uh pig chicken suicide not recommendable uh by most means however i kind of appreciate it i wish there weren't there wasn't any cruelty in it because then i would actually probably lo like genuinely love the film um but that just really drags it down in my opinion and the final film i'm going to talk about is a film from 2016 known as midori the camilla girl this is a live action adaptation of a manga which was adapted in 1992 um, as the anime Midori, also known as Shoujo Subaki. Um, it's the same plot as that um, as that anime OVA, which I'm pretty sure I mentioned on my like overlooked disturbing movies list, as well as I think I might have put it on my most disturbing movies, my final one that I made. Um, but essentially, the manga that anime adaptation, and this live-action film from 2016 tell the story of a young girl named Midori who is uh, orphaned after her mother dies, and basically she's taken in by a traveling freak show carnival who... and, and she basically lives with them um, and, you know, is forced to kind of do manual labor in order to keep a roof over her head and earn her meals. On top of all of that, you have this added element of all of the freaks in this freak show um, just genuinely abusing her mentally, physically, emotionally, and it's not fun at all. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just going to keep saying the the phrase not fun because that pretty much just encapsulates this whole thing uh 
you know, and, and, and something that I've always, I've always uh, read and kind of agreed with is that, like, live-action adaptations of anime or manga usually don't pan out too well because they end up, to quote an actual review I read of this film, being a cosplay party done on an extremely low budget. However, the Camilla girl is actually, like, like, it's cheap visually. There's some bad visual effects. However, I, I think, like, the, the outfits, costumes are nice, and I, I really like that aspect of it. I think there's some nice, beautiful visual, um, visual, uh, like, the visual aesthetics are really nice. And the anim there's animation in the film as well, which is also really, really nice. I kind of wish this was just another anime adaptation with that, um, animated style, because it would have been really cool. Uh, yeah that's uh yeah that's 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 kind of it um yeah no that's the, i think that's it so that's 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 the whole list from top to bottom it is godzilla versus hedora the cremator joy of torture manson family movies the cook the thief his wife and her lover a certain kind of death joshua witch hammer Pig Chicken Suicide, and The Camilla Girl. That's it. Some classic Biscuit Boo Horror Reviews content for you guys. I hope that that is um, satisfactory. I kind of just wanted to talk about some movies that I watched this year that I found kind of interesting, so I figured why not just do this. Um, yeah. Anyway, guys, this is uh, Biscuit Boo Horror Reviews signing off. Peace.